I don't need to preach now. That was power, man. So I want to invite a couple of people up, um, and some of them don't know that I'm actually inviting them up. But Clem, do you want to come? Clementine, uh, Govind, where are you? There you are. And uh, Tim. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys, while you're walking up, I've already asked Clementine, to tell us about the first time that, you, that the Holy Spirit touched you in a powerful way and how it changed your life. Clem is going to talk what you guys think. Morning, everyone. Um, so it was at the old warehouse, I think it was warehouse number seven, five, warehouse number five, and Joel Ramsey was visiting from South Africa. I was pretty new in the church, um, and he, if you've witnessed him, he's pretty awesome, but I was like, this is far out. And um, I remember watching Andy go down under the Holy Spirit, and I was like, oh my goodness, this place is nuts. And I was facilitating at the time, and I remember at the end just being like, clear the chairs and get out of here. And Starla saw me and was like, come have a chat. And I'm like, oh gosh. So um, I went over, and he was like, do you want prayer? And I was like, no, thank you, but you know, pleasure to meet you. And he was like, go on. And we started praying. And I felt really strongly that he was pushing me, and I kept opening my eyes and getting really cross with him and saying, don't touch me, this is not going to work if you're, you know, if you're pushing me. And he's like, I'm not touching you. And I'm like, okay. And I start laughing, I'm like, this is insane. And I keep thinking he's pushing me, and I go back, and I end up sitting on a speaker and just laughing hysterically at this guy. And I was like, I am so, I'm mortified, I'm so sorry, I think he thinks I'm being rude. And I'm not, and I'm just laughing hysterically for about 20 minutes. And I'm like, this is wild, what's this? And Stala's like, it's the Holy Spirit. I'm like, what? Um, I remember getting in my car and going to leave. And if you remember, there used to be the Audi garage just outside. I remember I had to pull over because, you know, what was he, drunk in the Holy Spirit? I could not drive. I'm just sitting, laughing in my car for, for probably about 20 minutes before I could get driving again. Um, and it was the most... I didn't invite it. I didn't want it. I thought this guy was not right. Um, And it was just the most tangible, awesome, incredible, definitely supernatural experience. Who's next? Thanks, Dan, for not giving me a heads up. So my name is Govin, like he mentioned, uh, I actually come from a Hindu background, and uh, in whatever religion it is, uh, uh, I come from a sect of people known as Brahmins. Basically, they were the Levitical priests in Hinduism. So before I move on, how much time do I have? (laughs) One one minute. (laughs) Great. So I'll try my best. Um, So um, when I I came to Jesus, uh, I didn't necessarily have a Christian worldview. Uh, I didn't have a God concept like uh, how we know Jesus. I didn't know Jesus like we know Jesus now. So I didn't even have a lot of language uh, for how I experienced God. Um, When I came to Jesus, I was on the verge of suicide, strung out on drugs, depressed, an alcoholic. Um, I'd done a lot of illegal things in this country, yes. Um, So basically hopeless. And uh, it was in that place where one... I think it was at four in the morning in a friend's living room. I surrendered my life to Jesus. And again, I felt a sense of release, which I didn't know at the time was Holy Spirit doing something in me. Not long after, probably not even a couple of days, I found myself in a prayer meeting and people were worshiping God. Um, Back then, we used to worship God for just four or five hours straight, and that was all that we knew to do. So I walked into a room of 10, 15 people and uh, seeing them give themselves passionately to God, there were two thoughts going to my mind. Either, this is crazy, these guys are on something, and I'd like to try it out, <laughs> or God is real, okay? Um, but to be honest, I wasn't really being expressive, I was trying to keep to myself, but somewhere about two hours into the worship service, I began to experience tears, which again, at the time, I did not know um, was God doing something in me. Towards the end of the night, they asked me if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and... Um, uh, you know, like, I don't come from a background where people battle over these things, okay? I didn't choose what stream of Christianity to jump into. I came to God, and, and all that happened was uh, they laid hands on me, and 
All I can best describe today was that bolts of electricity began to shoot through my body. Before I knew it, I was on the floor, shaking, and praying in an unknown language. And the only thing that could go through my mind that was trying to catch up with what was going on was, oh my God, you're real. God, you are real. This is real. You are real. This thought kept going through my mind because at the time I was living in a house where other than, I don't even want to name some of these things, but pretty much it was, it was like a frat house, okay? I was living in a house where people were doing all kinds of things, and that's the house that I went back to, but I did not have a craving for a single thing because God had touched me. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, walking with Jesus, I never really looked back. That's the shortest I could do, so... Okay, so I'm going to give you two, two encounters, and they're quite different. Uh, obviously, over my life, I've had a number of times where the Holy Spirit has fallen on me. I was born into a Christian home, but it was um, quite an austere branch of Christianity called the Open Brethren. Bible-believing, God-fearing, but God-fearing, fearing being the emphasis of the word. So, as Coral will tell you, my dad was quite a scary dad. And uh, he was 46, 47 when I was born, so really he didn't have the patience for a young, obnoxious kid running around him. So I grew up with a lot of father issues. And I remember when I was about, oh gosh, 22, 23, John Wimber, um, who some of you may know from California, he brought a mission over to London. And whilst I'd often sought baptism of the Spirit and stuff like that over my teenage years, all very clandestinely hidden from my father because that was devil worship in his view, his theology. Um, the Holy Spirit fell on me one night. I went forward for ministry. And there are times when the Holy Spirit comes where you're just out on the floor. And I was out on the floor went on what I'd like to call God's operating table for about three or four hours. And that I didn't understand all that was going on. But when I got up from that floor after, you know, they were jangling the keys to the church because they wanted to lock up and it was about one in the morning by this stage, um, I knew that something had changed. And that became a step change in some of that suppressed stuff for fearing dad, uh, and fear, which was then transposed on fearing God as my father had gone, you know, being cut away. And I think the other thing I'd like to refer to, because this is the other way the Holy Spirit works in, in my experience, is a journey. Uh, roll forward till well, it's about mid 40s and we're in Dubai and I entered a severe depression and I was on Prozac for 10 years and towards the end of that journey I realized that this wasn't God's plan for me I didn't have to live as the doctor was saying with a permanent dependency on taking antidepressants so I actually ended up with a Sozo, you know, at the church I was in at the time, it's their equivalent of Breaking Free that we do here. It was actually with young Govind there. And in that session, the Holy Spirit de dealt with the remaining lies about me not being good enough, me not being acceptable to Father. And in an instant this time, at the end of quite a long process, um, I was set free from depression. Now, the miracle of that was I was unemployed at the time. And the depression had started 10 years prior when I was unemployed. And during my unemployment the second time around, God broke the dependency on, on drugs. But that was a process. It was about over years learning to replace the lies that I was believing with God's truth. And so the Holy Spirit, my work, in my experience, worked in two ways. The instant, the dramatic, you're out cold, you know, on the floor, God's operating table. But sometimes the Holy Spirit works with us over a journey, over time, to bring us to the place of freedom. Wow. Wow. Star, I don't know if you're going to share your story next week, but if you're not, can you just share one of your encounters with the Spirit? Um, okay, I can mention Joel Ramsey. He was here. He's now leading a church in America. We need to bring him back. But... Um, you know, I've found that God actually doesn't seem to move too much with me in meetings when the piano is playing and when we're creating a moment. It seems as if he seems to work with me um, just at times that don't suit me. And um, so I think it was like our meeting was finished. You know, people were getting flung across the room at that meeting. There was real, nothing conjured up. It was really powerful encounters. And then we were ready to take him for dinner, and we went to Aloe Beirut, which is on Hesse Street, an Arabic restaurant. 
And uh, we just thought that's the quickest thing to do before we drop him off. And uh, we, I don't know, we were eating saj and chicken shawamas. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God touched me. And I just began to laugh hysterically. I mean, Dan, and no one's touching me. No one's praying for me. But it's just the residue, maybe, from the evening that was happening. And I just was filled with joy. And I wanted to fall off my chair laughing. I was laughing so much. But you know what was interesting was we were actually going to start... Um, our RVF journey the next day. And so after 10 years of absolute, you know, grief for not being able uh, to conceive when we had one or two, it was interesting that God was giving me joy for the journey um, and just joy for walking through RVF. And now we have um, a tw- and joy for a twin pregnancy. <laughs> yeah, so God is, yeah, he journeys with us, gives us what we need. That's awesome. I remember Starla at that meeting because we like John and I chatting and then all of a sudden Starla's head just goes down like onto the table like almost hits her tabule and just like the, the presence of God and, um, and I, I felt at the nine uh, someone came up to me afterwards who's, who preaches around the world he says it was great and we're all for it but it felt like that crowd you were trying to, it was like trying to push a truck up a hill and it did feel like that and I thought man God we need to do something different so I'm glad we're able to share some of those stories because I think it creates faith in us and, uh, and not just make a nice little sermon. And I've been thinking a lot about the Spirit of God. And I mean, since the guys have been on the stage, I can sense God's presence, which is awesome. Haven't felt Him yet until they started to speak, which is awesome. And um, I just, I've been thinking a lot about like the Holy Spirit and us walking with the Spirit. Yes, He is. He's, he's the, he, uh, he walks alongside us. He's the comforter, but He is the power and the presence of God. And if you've ever lost someone that's close to you, and people will say that if you've lost someone who's close to you, you miss their presence. And I, I still, I feel like the church has forgotten about the presence, the very presence of the Holy Spirit, because like these stories that have been shared, it's outside of our framework of what we think Christianity should be. And I want to say, let's just go back to Scripture Let's go back to Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 28. Let's go back and see what Jesus did. Let's go look at Acts 10 that says that Jesus anoint, that the, the Father anointed Jesus to go do good works and to, to heal the sick. Let's go back to, to what, because those moments that Tim, that Govind, that Clementine, that Star, that myself, and I can mention others in the room, have had, even if it was young and you're a teenager and you encountered God, has, has, has locked you into something so incredibly powerful. You've tasted and seen, and maybe you live in that, but I honestly think as a community, I feel like God wants to take us deeper. And we've been speaking about going into the river. Uh, and this is part of it. This is part of just hearing other people's stories. It gives us faith to go, do you know what? God, today I'm going to step out. And we're going to make a time at the end where we're just going to just pray. We're going to pray for God to come. We're going to pray. If you want prayer to come up, I'm going to ask all of those guys who've shared. I'm going to even ask Asi. I'm going to ask Jaya. I'm going to ask anyone on the prayer team, all, any of the community group leaders to be up here waiting to pray, to lay hands, because there is something of a transference that happens in faith as we lay hands on people that we begin to see the Holy Spirit move in their lives. And we're not meant to live in dull, boring Christianity. And I started, my, my sermon started basically with this guy in the first meeting, with this guy who was in the Olympics in 2004. And he was a, a marksman, incredible marksman, uh, one of the best. His name is Matthew Emmons. And he just needed to hit the target. He was kind of in the finals. He didn't even need to get a bullseye. And he just needed to hit the target. He needed to, needed to go somewhere on the target. And he goes up and he lines up and he ends up shooting the wrong target. And his guaranteed goal became eighth. And, uh, and the thought behind that is that I think the church has been aiming at the wrong target. That we've been aiming at the pseudo-Christian life that's about discipline and, and uh, us making our best life now and, and uh, making church this, this kind of slick machine where it's not meant to be that. And I love that a couple of weeks ago we called it messy church and technically we're still in that. But let our hearts never get so kind of neat and tidy. Let, it, let the Holy Spirit come and mess us up. Let Him come and do what He needs to do. Invite Him. He is good. He is kind. He is Jesus. He is like Jesus. He, he wants to come in. And if Jesus was in the room right now, I guarantee you, because He's omnipotent and omnipresent, He'd be able to walk up to every single one of us and minister into the deepest part of our hearts, and we can forget that that is who the Holy Spirit is. 
And Star and I have been chatting a lot about, the, like, we, she's going to be speaking next week, and just how you can forget the Holy Spirit. You can carry on living life. You know He's close. You know you sometimes get into meetings, and then God gives you a prophetic word. You're like, okay, the Holy Spirit is there. But actually, He wants to walk with us. He wants to be with us. Uh, he, he wants to set people free of what we saw in the meeting, of anxiety, depression, fear, sicknesses. That is the, the gifts and the working of the Holy Spirit. And I did a, a fun little thing, and I've shared this before, but I thought it was quite cool. Church, these days, we expect a few things. Parking, a few different types of coffee. There has to be oatly milk. Because if there's not oatly, then, you know, I'm not coming back to your church. And it's summer. We better have some cold drinks. You know what I mean? Like, because it's, it's very hot. You know, we better have good parking. Okay, we are working on that. Uh, well, RTA is working on that on our behalf. Thank you. Uh, there has to be a 25, 30-minute sermon. It must be smart, funny. And just a little bit convicting with one application that I can take home and remember of the week. And then when you get into all these things, it's like I'm going to have 50 declarations of this. And it just gets so tiring, like, like propping up church. And I, I honestly don't think we're meant to live like that. I don't think if we follow Jesus, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's not a whole bunch of practices and all these things that get put on top of us. Just follow Jesus. And we do that by following the Spirit. So I believe that the early church would have expected this. And I, and I believe we're seeing that in City Lights. Amazing. We want to see community. We want to see the presence of the Holy Spirit, gifts operating. Uh, we, want, we don't want to see this, but there's, you expect persecution. Go and see the early churches in Turkey. They were deep inside of caves. They were hidden away. They were in homes. They were trying to stay away because they were, they were literally killed. There's going to be one-on-one -on -one and deep discipleship. There's going to be pastoral leadership as opposed to an entrepreneurial business type model in a church. And I have nothing against huge churches, but the problem is, and I've been talking to friends who've been part of churches, who've grown from our size into a mega church, and they said, there comes a point where you start to lose the authenticity, and you start to lose, and it's an incredible leader who can keep that going into a church into the thousands, and I'm not negating that. There is probably amazing guys like that. But for us in this region, and the, what God's placed in my life, it has to just be a multiplication of around this size. Because this we can still get to know one another. I can look around the room, see nearly everyone that's in there. I will not get to talk to you, but you know that you are loved. Hopefully someone else has spoken to you. We make space for the Spirit to move. I think these, even the space, how the hall's been laid out, is quite cool. Francis Chan says this, when I read the book of Acts... Uh, I see that the church is an, is an unstoppable force. The church was powerful and spreading like wildfire. Not because of clever planning, but, um, but by the movement of a spirit. Riots, torture, poverty, or any type of persecution couldn't stop it. Isn't this the type of church movement we long to be a part of? That is the church movement that I believe God wants and he wants us to live in that. And that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8. I'm going to read this a lot over the next couple of weeks. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power hit Govind. That wasn't like a nice little gentle feather. Like the power of God touched him deeply. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, and also Mary, and to the ends of the earth. John Stott, he says this, What we need now is not more learning, not more eloquence, not more persuasion, not more organization, but more power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. I can't conjure it up. We can do lights and maybe kind of some atmospheric music that can look like that. But you can't conjure up those moments that Govind, he met, there's 10, 15 of them worshiping for hours. Who wants to receive the Spirit? Yes, me. The Holy Spirit falls on him in a powerful way. Stala, outside of meetings. I was on a sound desk in a, in a, a school hall in 2001, and God met me, and I had this crazy encounter with the Father heart of God. I understood that I was loved. I just wept the whole afternoon. It was a sovereign thing. It's what I'm longing for. It's what I want to see. And it's that thing that's going to give you the stickability in following Jesus. Theology is good. Learning is good. All of that stuff is good. But the thing that's going to 
get deep in your heart is a, is a, is a knowing of the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. The word for the Spirit is the word pneuma, and it means breath or wind. And He is the oxygen that we need. At creation, the breath of God was, was the God breathed into Adam and Eve, and there was a laugh, there was the fall, there's Jesus came, the, the post-resurrection, Jesus again breathes into his disciples. That it is the breath of God, it's, it's the breath of God that is making us to be this new creation. We, we cannot do this, we cannot do church without the Holy Spirit, because I tell you down the line, you're going to get tired, you're going to get bored, you're going to uh, maybe deconstruct, if, you, if you're not having regular I'd say deep moments with the Holy Spirit. Not only in church and meetings, alone with, with your Father. John 7 says this. It says, on the, on the last, actually John 7 is 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. We are meant to live our lives from overflow. It's that you believe in Jesus, and it says here that by this, in, in case we under, didn't understand what he meant, it says, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later receive, Acts 2. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. And I was reading this one guy's view on this, is that in John 20, Jesus breathes into his disciples, that's the Spirit of God. So there's an awakening, there's a, there's, they get saved, our spirits are awakened, but then there's the subsequent infilling and empowering of the Holy Spirit that I believe honestly that God wants for every single person sitting here. And if you, hadn't, if you haven't had that moment, come for prayer at the end, get hungry, desire it. I can tell you so many stories, Bruce, Bruce's wife, Danae, uh, they're in Mauritius now, but she was telling a story, she came out of a very conservative uh, background where they would say that they were the, they taught on the Holy Spirit, but they never practiced it. And she said she was just desperate, like God, I I, was, I, I want to speak in tongues. I want to, I want your presence to fall on me. And she was driving away from a meeting, and God's presence came upon her in the car, and she started to speak in other tongues. It comes from desire. It's, it's, and we have to, we need this. We, we are the new, we are the, we are the end time people, the kingdom people. We need the power and the presence of God to do the work and the will of God. And it's, there's three things that it overflows into. It's number one is the fruit. And I'm going to go through these very quickly. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking by the Spirit is listening to his voice, tuning your ear to his voice, obeying his voice when he speaks. Verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The more we follow Jesus, the more we should have love in our hearts for others. Deep, self-sacrificial love, joy, peace. There's a story um, uh, with John Wesley. He was on a, on a ship across um, the Atlantic, and uh, those little rickety ships would obviously go through these crazy storms in the Atlantic, and he was on the ship with the Moravians, and the Moravians had a 100-year pr prayer, prayer meeting that they, that, that they carried on going, and then they, they used to be missionaries across the Atlantic, and, he was th and they were on the ship with John Wesley, and he was surprised when they're going through these crazy storms how at peace they were. I need that peace. I get on a plane, it shakes a little bit. I'm like, I grab the side. I just start praying in tongues. Like me holding the side is going to slow down the plane somehow. It doesn't work like that. And the pilots tell me, you know, I don't have to worry about it. I'm like, you don't have to worry about it. I worry about it. I'm still, that's part is still working on my life. Peace, forbearance, kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And if you've noticed that the guys on stage all have headphones or in-ears, and in the in-ears is a thing called a click, and I've shared this before, but it goes tick, 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 tick. It's the worst, okay? It's, I call it my arch nemesis just because I like to be a little bit more freer uh, and don't be constrained by someone else to tell me how I should play uh, my guitar. Anyway, so it's basically to keep the band all in timing so the drummer doesn't have to follow the leader. And um, it's, 
And I honestly, and I started to think like that in some ways is what it means to follow the Spirit. It's just it's this constant listening. You can't step out of that. Because if you step out of that, you go off timing. And everyone knows who the one is going off timing. And generally in worship, it's me, Alistair. I look back at him. He's laughing. He's stopping and starting the click track the whole time while I'm on. And, um, and it's, 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 it's beginning to hear that little voice. And like, sometimes it's down to the smallest things. Like this week, I wanted to send someone. I'm going to be very nondescript here. A screenshot of something that would have caused us both to gossip about that. Like it's, and it would have been like, it was just, it was so tantalizing, guys. I'm going to be honest with you. That was a moment that I had, to, I was like, ah, I want to send this because we're going to have a great conversation about this afterwards. And it's not overly sinful, though it probably was. And, uh, and I just felt God said, don't do that. It's like, but God, dude, I'm just going to have some fun. You know, like, I know the person I send it to, they'll, they'll take it as a joke, it's a joke, and I says, don't do it, because my hand's on that person. I was like, okay, cool. And it was hard not to, and even the other day, I was like, I'm going to go back and get that screenshot, and I still didn't do it, thank you, Jesus. But that's sometimes how it is, it's like listening to him, and, it's, and, I, and I, I, say that, I say that as someone who's obeyed in that moment, but probably hasn't obeyed a hundred other times, and you could see the fruit of disobedience, keeping in step with the Spirit, what He says, what He does, how He moves. We don't aim at, aim at fruit, we aim at relationship. John 15 is we abide in the vine. It says, the, who abides in the vine, which is been close to Jesus, will bear much fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits as individual, like, okay, I'll pick that one, but I'm not huge on patience. No, no, it's, the, it's all of that that is the fruit of of the Spirit. The second thing is that we have the power for witness. Acts 4 29 says, Now the Lord, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through your name, through the Holy Servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. A byproduct of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking the Word of God boldly, witnessing boldly. There's like a supernatural thing that comes upon your life. I can tell you that if you knew me before Jesus, I was shy. I didn't like to stand up in front of people. I didn't like to talk. It wasn't something that I desired. I got saved. I got filled with the Spirit. All of a sudden, I had these desires to go lead people. I had a desire to speak in front of people. I had a desire to follow Him. I had a desire to say, come along with me. I, uh, within a few months of getting saved, I was put in charge of groups. There's, because God had put a gift on my life through His Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God. Is, okay, I'm going to hear myself there. Peter's another example. Denying Christ, a few pages later, he's preaching to the very people who crucified Christ. Incredible boldness. If you need boldness around this, wait on God. We need boldness to witness. Another incredible story. Nicky Gumbel from Alpha Course. Um, there was a story where John Wimber, now John Wimber, as Tim mentioned, was from the vineyard. He was this guy that I think actually really caused a renewal in the 80s and 90s uh, around the world. He would travel the world and just speak about the gifts of the Spirit and an infilling and, and power and healing and all these things. And he was ministering at HTB, which is Holy Trinity Brompton, posh part of London. And the Bible says that if it's, it's harder for a rich man to get through out of a needle than to come to him. So you know, like he's ministering into a tough space. I don't know if Nicky Gumbel was, was yet the vicar or whatever it is. But they had this, these, these Holy Spirit meetings. And there was the story when Nicky Gumbel was lying on the floor under the power of God. And everyone was kind of, they lifted him up to take him out of the room. As he stood up to take him out of the room, John Wimber looks at him and says, God is putting on you now a spirit of evangelism. And like kind of the years that followed that was the Alpha Course where there's millions upon millions of people that have found Jesus. It's still this ongoing 20, 30, 35 years later, there's this movement because of a spirit encounter. How much more would God want to do something amongst someone in this room? What if you just say, I'm hungry, Jesus. I'm a teenager. I don't know much. It doesn't matter. The, the disciples didn't know much either. And we can live... Our Christianity week to week, or we can say, God, enough now. I want that I need this power that you've been speaking about. Your word says it. I'm convinced by your word. And if you need more convincing and you have a lot of time to read, go read a guy called Gordon Fee. He will convince you from an academic level that the Holy Spirit is for today, the gifts are for today, and it'll change your life. 
and make you hungry for the reality of who God is and not just to come and listen to a sermon, but encounter the living God. And then the third thing that God anoints us for is for gifts. The gifts of the Spirit is to serve and to set people free. It's not a show. It's not to make someone look better. You talk to Annalie, and I've used her as an example a few times. She, has, she gets words of knowledge, which, which, by the way, the word of knowledge she gave last week to Titus and Fiona was their, her, their marriage date, her birthday, and her name was Fiona. She says, there's a Fiona in the room. I see Shrek and Fiona. At their wedding, the, the jo- people jokingly called them Shrek and Fiona. Um, it was just like a thing. And then that night, she is having a private conversation with her husband about something that Annalene mentioned in that word of knowledge. Okay, so that's, we talk about this at staff meeting. Annalene goes, it's not me. I'm like, well, you stood up there and you said it. And, she, and I think she's got a, a right perspective that she is the vessel that God just decides to use for that moment. But I think if any one of us had to put up, there's gifts on every single person here. Gift of prophecy, gift of serving, we'll list them all at the end. Whatever it is, there's, there's something on all of your lives. If you just say, God, what is it? And you're going to go through this in community groups this week. So just whatever community group leaders have a little look at me right now. Whatever you're doing this week, Pause it, because Ryan's going to give you a bunch of stuff. You're going to go through the gifts, and there's probably people in your, in your group that are already operating the gifts of prophecy and stuff, and we're going to have an exploration in community groups around the gifts of the Spirit. Is that cool? Okay. It's just we gave an executive order from here. Okay. 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. This is Paul writing. You know that uh, when you're pagans, uh, somehow or the other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes. Verse 5, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, is it, the, it is the same God at work. All gifts are for today, and all gifts are integral for the mission and the forward movement of the church. That. Every single person here is, is called to, to rise up into the gift that is on their lives. I look across at Nate and Beck. They, they came into our church. There's a gift of leadership on their life. It's obvious to others. Okay, let's, let's give them a community group, thriving community group. And now involved with, with Patty and Ernesto, and they're doing the business for them. There's a gift of leadership. It's to gather and to take people somewhere. And it says, those with the gift of leadership do it with zeal. And that's, that's one of the gifts. I'll, I'll mention them at the end. Um, it's for the mission of the church. It's different to a natural gift or an acquired gift. Some are good at sports uh, naturally, or maybe you've acquired a gift, you've learned something, you've studied something over time. A spiritual gift is a divine given abilities that enable us to do the ministry of God. It's, it, it's from Him, and you'll see now that He's the one He distributes in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these uh, are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes to each one just as He determines we are but vessels as the Holy Spirit moves. Now, Ephesians 4.11 has pastor, teacher, prophet, apostle, and evangelist. It says those are for the church so that, so that the church can rise up and do the ministry. So I'm, I'm, by gifting, I'm a pastor. But we'll have people who come into this church like a Joel Ramsey who's more of an evangelist. And he'll come in and he'll pray for people. And all of a sudden, we all just want to be evangelists. Then you might have someone who's prophetic, like a prophet like Julian Adams. He comes in and he prophesies over people, but he equips us to do the ministry. You have Ian McKellar who's coming at the end of the month who's a teacher. And when he gets up to teach, like, we don't need anything else but this guy. Because, and that's what it should be. Because those people who come in and we've got different gifts within City Lights and growing gifts in City Lights. It's to equip all of us to walk into the rest of the gifts that God has put on our lives. And some of you are operating in the prophetic right now, but actually God may have a prophetic or prophet calling on your life. Some of you are leading community groups, you're shepherding people, you're loving people, but maybe there's a pastoral call on your life that God is preparing you for. And I can see that in my life. I wasn't the most eloquent, the most qualified, uh, it, it didn't, none of that mattered. God had put a gift on my life to pastor people, and wherever I went, People were pastored, loved, and we could take them somewhere. 
It, it's like, and it's because it's a divine, obviously I need to grow that and improve that and become a better preacher and become better at the, in all of these things. But it's, it's, it's God that says, okay, that, that is the gifting and calling on your life. And I do not think we are meant to walk around aimlessly and blind and go, okay, God, what am I meant to do? No, no, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. In the meantime, serve. Serve everywhere. Always serve everywhere and God will work out the specifics. I'll miss that. Holy Spirit anointed Jesus to do the gifts. Um, I'm going to list the gifts here. This is Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Romans 12 is prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving. And a lot of these can work alongside. So you may have 1, 5, 10. Let me talk about the, okay, the thing of giving. That is someone who has a gift, and there's a few people in the church who, who will give, and they, they don't need to be known about it. They find absolute joy in it. They can see the work of God increase because of their gift of giving on their life. They get accolade from their Father in heaven. That is a gift of giving. It says, if you've got the gift of giving, do it with generosity. That's, it's, it's a gift on people's lives. We all should be generous, yes, but there is certain people that carry in a greater way a gift of giving. Same as the, with leadership, with mercy. You talk to someone who has a gift of mercy, like a Nicky Nordea, and you see everything through her eyes. You're like, man, I'm not, Je- I'm not like Jesus enough because she, she's, there's just compassion that flows from her. But that is her gift that is actually a gift for the body. So we we may be weak in that area, but then Nikki comes along and she brings her gift of mercy and compassion, and now we are strong in that area. And that's that is how it works. That is so there should be a space and freedom for all of us to operate within the God given gifts on our lives. There's the word of wisdom, these are uh, ministry gifts, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, Stala has it. Um, I always joke that the force is strong with her. Um, Speaking in tongues, uh, the interpretation of tongues. We had that for the first time in our church on Sunday night. Dwayne came up. He's like, Dan, I've got a tongue and interpretation. I'm like, oh, Lord, (laughs) please let this work. And it was powerful. And it ministered to people. He gave this word. And the amount of people that have got hold of him afterwards and said, oh, that actually spoke to me and this and that. I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. Um, And we did it because we trust him. (laughs) Interpretation of tongues, healings, helps, and the diversities of tongues. And I, my prayer is that God, with all of these things, the fruit to witness, to, to walk in the gifts, we need the presence and the power of Jesus. And I don't know what church background, you may have been conservative, you may have been from a seeker-sensitive church, you may be from any of these things. I'm not saying we're the perfect church, we've got a whole lot of things wrong, but what we want is the power and the presence of Holy Spirit. We need Him, we cannot do this without Him. Can we stand to our feet, please, and let's pray. So I want to ask the band to come up, but again, like I said last week, we're going to spend a little bit of time just waiting before the band plays, Um, because we just need, we want the raw, real power of Jesus, and anyone who's got prophetic words or something that God's stirring inside of their heart, please come and talk to us, and we'd love to kind of share that out. So, Father, we do wait on you. Your word says that uh, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. And we are asking today for your Holy Spirit. We know you're here. You've been welcome from the moment we started the church, but we want to acknowledge you, Holy Spirit. And as a community, God, we need you. We don't need anything else. Come fill us, Father.
God, we are hungry. We're hungry for more. Can I ask um, anyone on the prayer team, um, Govan and Tim as well, and Carl, Rochelle, any of the elders, just to be ready to pray. I want to pray. For, uh, we can play some music, Ted. I want to play some. I want, I want to pray for people to be filled with the Spirit. We can't preach a sermon about being filled and not give an opportunity. So, could could those guys just come and stand up? The prayer team, the elders. Governed, Tim, and any community group leaders, please just be ready. And uh, here's the thing we don't have our lights off, so it doesn't matter. We have family. If you, if you need prayer for anything, you're like, man, I've been struggling. Someone was talking about that depression thing. I'm still not feeling set free, even though we prayed it. I want prayer. Or could we just, as we we're praying, you were sensing God begin to move on your heart? Can you just please come up? Find someone you trust. We're just going to wait.